a couple weeks ago, I was having a great conversation with Mark Goring about some work that I've been involved with at the U of M's Humphrey School, where I'm in a graduate program. And I'm working there with a professor who focuses in part on issues of civic engagement and public participation in the public sector. And I um, you know, can't help but bring my co-op lens to that kind of work, right? So there's a lot of relevance. Co-ops are representative democracies that really aspire to be participatory democracies. So any kind of academic work that really looks at what it means to be in a participatory democracy is naturally very interesting to me. Um, and so I was um, talking to Mark with that, and, and he suggested that perhaps it might be worthwhile to come and just share a little bit of my learning with you. So this is academic hour. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, you know, it's extremely relevant, and we all know this, this quote is familiar to us now from the blueprint, but participation is deemed a really important asset of cooperatives. So learning more about that and understanding it better um, is certainly to our advantage. So I'm, uh, what you see up here is, um, comes from the work of this professor whose name is Catherine Quick. And um, I really, really like it as a way to represent how public managers bring share stakeholders into um, the process of creating public policy or planning or grappling with some public issue. And the way she conceptualizes it and, and also the way that she reads it out of practice is to think of it as a hierarchy, but not a vertical hierarchy. It's a nested hierarchy. And the relationship between each of the concentric rings is how more or less inclusive the practice is. So um, if you look at the center of the ring, you'll see kind of an olive dot, and it's marked participatory. And in this scheme, that's really um, the least inclusive not the least important, but the least inclusive, and that's really a one-way flow of information with your stakeholders. So that's getting input. So I think in our world, that might be um, surveys that you might get, or even a message board in your store, where you're inviting people to comment, you're taking that information and using it to make better decisions, but it's really just a unidirectional kind of flow of information. Moving farther out into the blue-green um, portion of the, of the, um, the hierarchy, we move more into kind of collaborative and deliberative. So now we're in more of a two-way conversation. And I think Christina Nicholson kind of described beautifully what that might look like and what that looked like at Mississippi Market, where you're really bringing your stakeholders in to have a conversation where you're cons um, considering an issue and maybe even coming up with recommendations that you will then give to a decision maker. So the power to make the decision is not in the hands of those stakeholders, but um, the collective wisdom that emerges from that process is really important in, in, in the final decision. And finally, if we move all the way out into the outside purple ring, that is um, what is deemed inclusive management in this, uh, in this scheme. And inclusive management really throws it wide open. So you invite stakeholders in, and you actually ask them to help you define the issue to define the process that you're going to use to grapple with the issue. Um, there's um, shared power about, about what happens and what decisions might be made. It's a long-term engagement, an iterative process where people come back again and again. And some, it sounds almost extraordinary that there's actually public participation <laughs> processes that work this way, but there are. And it's not that common. But when it does happen in a community that um, the public participation process looks like this, some very amazing things happen. So um, something that um, kind of the research and observation shows is that you tend to create a lot of resources together. You develop a lot of social capital. You have profound and deep connections that spread throughout the community in ways that you maybe never would have imagined. Um, so um, you might ask, so what? So what's a good question? And for our purposes here today, as we think about going back and potentially participating um, and, and, and having some engagement with our stakeholders, um, this framework can help us think through some of these very simplified steps about designing an engagement process. So first of all, you know, you want to figure out what is the purpose of my engagement? What outcome is it that I'm hoping for? Because you need to have a, des a destination before you can devise your roadmap. And then um, you can start really drilling down into what kind of practices and process will help, whether it's World Cafe or a survey, because you know, you're really going to design it to draw from people um, um, what it is that you need to, to make the decision or, or pursue the um, initiative that you're talking about. Then you move into um, building trust with your participants. And I think that this is something that really emerges strongly in the literature, how important it is to really be clear about what kind of um, 
uh, out impact people's participation is going to have. So you really need to communicate to your stakeholders, we want you here and we're going to use this information for this reason and, and um, your involvement will have this impact. And be also clear about the extent to which it will actually influence decisions. So if it's not going to be a vote where people get to decide, people need to understand that. And being clear about that and communicating that tends to build trust and will bring pe people over time will trust the process and perhaps come back into it. And then finally, of course, you know, you need to harvest your results and you need to evaluate them. And then again, to close that trust loop, you need to report back to your stakeholders so that they really understand why they were there and what impact it had. So um, what I hear when I'm being yelled at is people loving me very loudly, right? So I thought this was kind of a great way to introduce um, one of the big anxieties I think that we have about doing engagement is that people were just going to like, people are just going to come yell at us, right? So I've been on boards where we've talked about doing member engagement and been afraid to do it because we were just going to get yelled at. And I think one of the values of really thinking through your engagement process and planning it well is that you won't get yelled at as much. And actually, if you do it well, do it properly, focus it properly, you're going to make much better decisions and you know, you're going to get yelled at less. So, so that's the incentive <laughs> among many others. Um, so I'll just end with this. I mean, I think that the blueprint tells us, and I think experience in this room tells us how important participation and engagement is in our cooperatives. Um, and there's a real imperative for us to figure it out. Um, uh, we want to remain um, open to new possibilities for it so we can engage a whole new generation of cooperators. And uh, at the end of this seven-year cooperative decade, find the success that we all hope that we'll have. Thanks.